Welcome, glad you're here, and uh, welcome to you folks online. So uh, we're trying to get better with that live streaming stuff. Thank you for tuning in. Today's garden class is going to be on what and how to plant. So you got a different mix of plant material that you can put in the ground in the summer as opposed to spring or winter. But we'll go over some of that, and then also just how do you put it in the ground? So I was doing some gardening this week, and uh, the ground is really dry. I mean, it is like there's not a drop of moisture anywhere. It's just bone dry. And so we'll go over how to compensate for that. So you can't just throw a, a, a plant into dry soil to have it succeed. It's going to stress out terribly. There's, there's tricks to it. So we'll, we'll share that with you here shortly. Uh, so my name is Ken Lane. I own the garden center. So my wife and I have owned it since 1992 or been owners. We became 100% owners in 02. So it's been almost 20 years. Wow. Harold Waters, the founder, he actually came in today or yesterday. He was, he was in a couple times this week. He can't stay away. He's now 82, 83. I forget how old he is. Once you reach 80, it's kind of like you're just, you're just that age. It's just it. And so he's still going strong. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps marching on. Only instead of drums, he's just doing it with a shovel. He's still, his brain is still garden-esque. And he loves coming in and seeing the new introduction to the plant. He's a hardcore gardener. So he comes in just for that. Um, anyway, his wife, Lorna, if you're from local, you kind of know the, the names. Uh, Lorna's still alive and well, going great. So the both are still heading out to Costco, getting their stuff. Grocery stores, heading to church, kind of come to the nursery. It's kind of fun, so walking the dogs. Family business, we've got four kids. So uh, a son and three daughters, and they have all worked or are working. Our two, two of our daughters are still working in the garden center. So one of them helps us manage, one of them works for elections. She's been running around the county this week with all the election stuff. So all the voting booths, she's a troubleshooter. And so if there's a problem with the machine, didn't boot up, sometimes she runs out, just helps it get back up. And then in her off time, she works for us. So it's kind of like we're her side gig. I love that. Um, today it's on planting. So summer, what you'll find here in the mountains of Arizona is there's, there's really five distinct seasons or plant mixes that you'll find that rotates through the garden center. We're mild enough, we plant year round. We don't actually shut down. So we'll actually have planting crews that go out virtually every day of the year, business, business days, uh, planting stuff. It just changes what, what is planted. Uh, right now you're into the summer mix. So things that love the heat, things that love the sun, things that love this kind of environment. That's what you're seeing. So crepe myrtles and rows of Sharon's and barberries. It's the mix you see out there in the, in the uh, um, middle of the garden center in between the two greenhouses. That's kind of the mix. Those are things that we actually prefer to be planted when it's warm. We're not going to sell a crepe myrtle in spring. They just don't like spring. They just sit there and they're basically twigs in a bucket. And no one wants a twig in a bucket when they've got a beautiful lilac in bloom filling up the entire part of the garden center fragrance. We'll sell all the lilacs out, but now you can hardly find a lilac. Now it's pretty myrtles because they're so beautiful and they're glorious. And no, nothing has that kind of color to it. It loves heat. Whereas lilacs are just green blobs in a bucket. Who wants a green blob in a bucket when you can have this beautiful, glorious thing in bloom? And so you'll see this rotation of crops, of, of, of plants at the garden center. From here, we go to fall. So fall color. So we're starting to see the fall colored shrub show up now. So we just had a load of maples, uh, uh, aspens, uh, burning bush. That fall colored mix, we're starting to ship now because we start to harvest. It will ship through October. You'll just see truckloads of these kind of fall colored plants. And we're famous for our fall color. I mean, Aspen Creek is right here. You can walk to it. So aspens do exceptionally well, that great gold color. You mix that with a autumn blaze maple or celebration maple or sensation. This great fall reds and oranges. You put a frontier elm in there with just this great red elm tree that's just beautiful. Uh, purples of, of raywood ash, that's your fall mix. Then you go to winter, usually that's November, December, January. Um, we'll start shipping that stuff. Uh, usually well, we ship it year round. We just have new spruce come in, new pine trees come in, but, but we'll bring in the bigger ones two times a year, usually in October. We'll bring in setting the stage for living Christmas trees. That's like a huge trend. Who wants to go cut tree 
and you can buy a living tree, use it, decorate it, and then go plant it outdoors. So we, we're kind of famous for that, bringing stuff just for that. And then you can plant that right through winter. So evergreens like, that's when they shine in the winter. Uh, and then you've got your early spring mix, uh, which would be, that's usually end of February, about Valentine's Day through April. It's considered early spring, really. Uh, it's still cold, it's still chilly, it can snow on us, but the days are really nice. And that's when things start to wake up. So your daffodils are in bloom then, your forsythia goes into bloom, that's when you buy forsythia lilacs, flowering quince, uh, the first of the rose crops start showing up in early spring. It's a good time to plant those. Uh, then you get into actual spring, that's just the mayhem. We just pack this place full and just everything, it's vegetables and herbs, lots of that mix. Yeah. Kind of even non-gardeners come in and buy stuff. So everyone's got to have a, a tomato plant. So we see an entire community coming in for tomatoes and thyme and rosemary, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I, I have a season of my own that I, that I like. I call it June, it's perennial month. Really, that's when the perennials, those are things that come back every year. Perennial flowers are really, really good up here. Uh, Phoenix folks, the desert folks, they want perennials. They just can't. It's too stinking hot down there. They don't, perennials need to go cold and they need to rest in the winter to be able to come back with that flush of, of flowers again for us. So those are your wild flowers. Well, June, the reason I like the month of June, June, July, that, that time frame, is uh, they're all in bloom. We'll have a few perennials earlier than that in spring and early spring, gallardias, coreopsis, but really they're just starting to emerge. They don't look their best. Starting in June, you start to see all of those perennials, they're up, they're full, and they're in bloom. So that's kind of, those are your seasons. So to repeat those, let's start from the beginning of the year. You've got winter, so that's your evergreen mix. That's the holidays, New Year's. Um, you've got early spring, March and April basically, spring, May through whenever it gets hot in June. Then you've got June is perennial month, your summer and then fall plants. Okay, so it's really more than just four seasons and, and we grow for each of those seasons, unique crops. Um, and, and if you're new to the area and you're seeing a certain kind of rose or a certain kind of herb or a certain tomato, uh, if you come back the next day, it, it very likely is gone. It won't be here. These are very finite crops. And so you, you want to grab them while you can. And then the next time you come in, it'll be something different. It'll be a different, something that's more, that's more correct for that season. Okay. So we just got these aspens in. I'll just give you an example. This came in yesterday. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I should have brought a smaller one. Um, I brought this because you'll see three kinds of aspens sold here at, at garden centers. There's only one you'll find here, but you'll see three different types. This is your, your uh, Populus tremuloides, the trembling leaf poplar. That's the wild one you see up at, at Aspen Creek. Um, there's two ways to harvest this, and we still got tight tape on there. It's, I should have dressed it up a little bit. There we go. So to ship them correctly, we, we uh, pull them together so they don't get beat up and trash or scraped on in the truck. Um, the, you'll see some that are harvested by ranchers. They're just wild properties. They'll go to Aspen Creek. They'll just start digging up aspens out of the wild, plopping them into buckets. Some of them are rooted out, some of them aren't, but they look rough. They'll be marled, they'll just be, you can tell they look wilder. Uh, the, un the uniformity is very uneven. So little tiny suckers, a great big trunk, so just be this inconsistency. Uh, we also found, we used to sell a lot of those, we found that the transplant rate wasn't as good. Uh, depending on how they were dug up and how they were rooted and where they rooted out further, um, some of them didn't take. So the loss rate was much, much higher on those. What we find with these, here we've taken a field, we've grown a whole bunch of aspens in a field, We'll dig them up and bare root them. And then we'll take three even ones and we just start plugging them. So now we got cookie cutter, very consistent clusters of aspens. Now we get more consistency. Sometimes they'll all appear to be the same. Sometimes we'll take a small one and two big ones. It just depends on our mood. We plug these in. We'll grow these out for a year. 
uh, root them out completely, and then we'll start to sow them now. So we're starting to harvest that crop, bringing them in, and, and now you can plant those. Aspens, fast growing. In fact, I've answered, I've answered two questions this week. It's very unusual. I don't know what this is all about, but people are telling me you can't grow aspens here. I just want to slap them. Uh, well, what do you mean you can't grow aspens? There's aspens everywhere. They're up at every elevation. Look at, look at your neighborhood. They're everywhere. What are you talking about? Smack. Uh, aspens do really well here. You can grow an aspen no matter what elevation. You'll see them up at the highest levels of, of Coon Creek, Highland Pines, all the way down to the lower elevations of Prescott Valley, Dewey, Humboldt. You'll even see them spill out to Paulden. Uh, I've grown them in Skull Valley, that's 4,000 foot level. Uh, what you do at the lower elevations is they'll be dependent on you for water. You'll need to irrigate them. So put them on the drip system, and make them go. Uh, they'll thrive for you, absolutely thrive. They like growing fruit. Now this is a classic poplar leaf. The European variety has a serrated edge. It looks more like a birch. Much different. It still has white bark, very white bark, uh, but the leaf looks more like a birch. It is actually Poplar's family, but it just, if you're going to live here, plant the right variety. Go with Popula, the, the native, native specimen. I think you'll be happier. Uh, so that's the variety we have. We have single trunks, multi trunks. You just see them in different forms, different heights. Um, how to plant. Then we'll go over how to water. This is a potentia. This is one of those summer mixes. This plant is amazing. It's about knee high, ball shaped. It's been in bloom since May, and it will continue to bloom through October. A huge bloom cycle. What I like about this is a pollinator, butterflies and that kind of stuff like it. And then I have javelina problems. I don't know how many of you all have javelina and rabbits and deer and stuff. They don't eat this. I mean, it looks delicious. I don't want to add some ranch dressing, dressing and, and have a little taste, but it's got a sap to it that just has a flavor they don't like. So you'll see it right out there, exposed in the sun, right there where herds of javelina flow, and, and they don't bother this plant. So it's a real good plant for here. Uh, very drought hardy. Once you get this thing rooted, so at first with the root ball real small, it's more sensitive, but once you flush that root ball out, it's really robust. It'll take blistering hot on a, on a south facing wall, radiant heat, once a week watering. It's fine. It just blooms like this. When you're planting this, realize your soil in your yard, it's terrible. Terrible. There's nothing redeeming about any of your dirt. So you need to amend that some. In fact, some of you, you're almost a detriment. You, you, you have negative, you're like toxic waste to plants. You're going to have to amend that. The little bit of, of topsoil that you did have, the contractor came in with a backhoe and the first thing they did was get rid of all the living life forms and you're on your lot. They just scraped it clean and now you're left with literally dead soil. There's not one living, you won't find one worm, not one mycorrhizal colony, you'll find no living, breathing thing in the dirt. There's no organic matter. And there's no way for you to replace or to cap that all off. You put fabric over it and then put another two inches of rock to ensure nothing ever grows. And so you gotta, you're got you going to have to compensate for some of that. And you, you do it hole by hole. You can't replace the whole yard. It's just not practical. But you can do, you can resurrect or bring back to life individual holes. And once you start introducing those, those living organisms, all of a sudden worms, they just find their way. The mycorrhizal colonies, that's the things that can kind of connect to the roots and they help plants grow. When plants see mycorrhizals in the soil, they go, whoa, this has got to be a good place. I'm going to root out here. They just start rooting. So once you start having, you start enlivening that section of the garden, it just things just start taking off for you. The way you do that, whatever the size bucket is, that's how deep the hole is going to be. But then you're going wide. You're not going, you can add a bucket on each side. Okay, so this would be about two and a half, three feet wide by what is that, about a foot deep. That's the size of the hole. Um, if you happen to run into a rock or a boulder or something gets in there, or a big root or something, dig that out. That's not going to help that plant. 
So get it out of there. Some of you are going to be chest high in a hole trying to get this junk out of the hole. Uh, but that's okay. You can compensate by adding some more organic material. If you can, though, most of us, we can dig a hole this deep. Much easier to dig a, a wide hole than a deep hole. Okay? You're going to have your soil off to the side, you know, wheelbarrow or tarp or just off to the side. Um, there you're going to screen or screen that soil. Anything bigger than a golf ball, get it out of there. It just heats up in the summer. The water molecules can't attach themselves. It just almost bakes. It roasts the, uh, the root ball. So you want to screen that out, out of there. I've tried to take shortcuts on, on this in the past, personally, and it fails just almost every time. Uh, so there's been some holes. I actually created a screen with half-inch mesh, and I screened the soil because I kept killing plants. The second I screened it, took off just like that. So just take the time to, to look at that soil and, and take it out of there. Some of you have, like Fresca Valley, you're notorious for those rocks that kind of, they almost float out of the ground and emerge every rainstorm. So those are things you want to you want to screen out of there because in the summer they'll heat up and they actually roast the roots. So just kind of take that. Any um, um, old uh, roots from old trees. As trees rot or compost in the ground, they actually taint the soil. They'll keep, they, they release creosodes and all kinds of strange chemicals to keep plants from growing in that spot. If you see that, pull those out. Big roots from tumbleweeds, and pine trees. Uh, just take those things out of there. That's why I tell folks if they actually lost a tree and they want another tree exactly in that same spot, probably not advisable. Unless you're going to hire a backhoe or something to dig that whole thing out of there. It's better to go off center a little bit. Go off three, four feet. Don't, don't plant the same hole so we're not surrounded by all those composting roots. They're going to affect the way the next plant grows. It won't be as, they won't thrive as much. Okay, so just school of hard knocks we've learned or seen over the years. The soil, once you got it all screened down, add some mulch. That's gonna be this stuff. So we make our own mulch, it's locally sourced. This is basically pine bark. We've got an old, uh, We've got an old sawmill over in Taylor, Arizona. We've got the access to the pilings, with the old, it's like 50 year old palings sitting there. We screen that down, and then we make our topsoil and our mulch for that. We'll add a little bit of this to our potting tool. Potting tool is mainly peat moss. This, this is really screened out a half inch minus, so it's a good top dressing for seed, that kind of stuff. But it's really, this is made to add to your native soil to amend it so that we can re enrich that soil. To, to attract the worms and the living organisms back into that surrounding soil. And it also, we're changing the structure of the soil. So if you dig up clay soil, you loosen it, you have it sit there, you take that clay soil and put it right back around the roots. The second you water it, it goes right back to the solid state that it came from. It goes right back to, to doesn't stay air aerated. If we add some organics in between the root, that clay soil, it helps to keep that soil from compacting back down. Now it allows the roots to get out through the soil. Allows it to start, encourages them to start going sideways. Um, if you've got a uh, real uh, granity or sandy soil, like up around Granite Creek, those, those or Granite Mountain, those areas are very crushed granite. The water just goes whoosh right through it. It's hard to keep things watered out there. So there, what we do, we uh, add some mulch to it to help hold the moisture. It actually acts like a sponge and holds moisture in so it keeps the water and fertilizer from, from flushing past the root ball. So there's some, some strategies to this. I'll add about 25-30% mulch to my native soil. Back to planting, how to, how to amend that soil. So 25-30%, you can go up to 50%. Some of you are going to plant in a divot because you pull up this big rock. You just need more filler, but if you get too much mulch, it can actually be detrimental. It stays too wet. And so a little bit is good, a lot is not good. So up to about 50-50, but really about 25%, one scoop of, of mulch to three scoops of, of native earth, it's good. Um, that's your mix, you're gonna backfill around that root ball. Now let's go over how to prep the roots. Let's take one, what's easy to work with. Let's take this nine mark. Um, it's probably gonna make a mess, but let's just see what happens here. Should be fully rooted. Oh yeah, this is perfect. So that's the perfect root ball. That's what you wanna see. 
What you don't want to see is roots wrapping around, growing around in circles. They call that root bound. Um, once a plant starts growing in circles, it doesn't stop. It just keeps, it just thinks it's been programmed. Grow in circles. That's natural. Grow in circles. Grow in circles. Um, here, you're seeing the roots just, it's fully rooted, but you're seeing new root hairs, new white root hairs are just starting to emerge. You put that in the ground, those new root hairs keep growing out just like that. It's perfect. Now, some plants are super aggressive. Willows, cottonwoods, lilacs, and some, they grow so fast that sometimes they'll start to wrap a little bit. If you start to see some of that, especially at the bottom of the, of the root ball, usually I'll cake right here. If I see that, I'll take my pruners or my knife and I'll just score the roots like that. And I'm just root pruning, that's what I'm doing, just real lightly. I don't take, I'm not under the, and that would probably be enough for this plant. I root pruned, cut some of the roots, and what we, the reason we do that, we'll put this right back in, the reason we do that, sometimes you'll make a cut on top, like say, say an apple tree. You'll make a branch cut, and all of a sudden you'll see two or three branches coming out where that, they're called suckers, start coming out from that prune. Roots do exactly the same thing. So when you make a cut, all of a sudden you get two or three roots forming from that cut. So there is a benefit to doing that. I just would never personally buy a root ball that was just started to be just truly root bound. Uh, usually you'll see those in the spring. Um, usually you'll see them at a box store. And it's leftover material from last year, usually it's cheap. The grower has to get rid of it because you're gonna it's going to the compost pile. Just buy it. Will you give me a buck for this? Just take it. And so it's old carryover material from last year they couldn't sell, now they sold it here. It's, you pull the roots down and you go, oh, this is this is not right. It's root bound. That's just last year's crop. It should not have been sold, but you got it for a bargain, so sometimes it's worth a try. Um, this would be better. Okay, when I plant that, I just scored it, put it in the ground. I'm going to take that and backfill that soil mulch mixture around that, tamp it down really, really well. Uh, two things roots do not like. One, they don't like air pockets. They will not grow through air. There is no such thing as air roots. I mean, that's air, air ponics, all, that, that doesn't happen in the soil. They don't want to transition through air pockets. They want consistency of the soil. Second, they don't like inconsistency of soil mix. So a mistake I've helped a couple clients out with lately is uh, they were taking a shortcut, they dug a hole, and they threw some mulch in the bottom, and they kicked on some native soil, and they put some more mulch on it, kicked on some soil, and they just had this layer of mulch, native soil. Um, roots hate that. They don't like that. They don't want to see different kinds of mixtures. They want to see consistency. So that's one, blend it first, and then backfill around that as consistent as you can okay um, pack it down then I'll water it in real good now right now a unique technique for now our soils are really dry and so if I were to take this nice moist healthy plant with new roots coming out I put this in the dry hole surround it with some dry mulch amended soil and then I try to water it I will never get enough water on that it won't be as consistent, though as the water filters through all that soil type, it'll be veins of water, and the plant won't like that. What I'll do right now when the soil's real dry, is I'll dig a hole, and while I'm mixing up my mulch and that kind of stuff, prepping the plant, I'm actually filling that hole up halfway with water. And all I'm trying to do is hydrate the soil around the root ball. What happens is, if you put a, a moist plant in a dry hole, that all that dry soil immediately sponges or wicks away um, the water from the root ball and the plants left dry even though it looks moist it's just dry 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 because we're trying the, the soil around it is trying to take away it's trying to rehydrate that's how soil is going to work just hydrate it just give just help it just just give it halfway full so usually when i'm planting this this is usually in the summer is the only, only time i do this um, i'll actually plant that root ball in a half mucky kind of soil kind of watery watery root ball at the bottom and I'll backfill them. By the time I end up backfilling with this, all that water has been whipped up by the remaining soil and no water ever goos back up out of the soil. Does that make sense? I explained that right? Uh, it's usually right now while it's hot. Once the rains come, the rains have got to come. We need the rains to come. So I've only seen this happen once before where it didn't rain. 
it was detrimental to the forest. I mean, Ips beetle and bark beetle, flathead borers just took over and killed huge sections of the forest. Whole neighborhoods of pine trees were just, just gone if they weren't cared for. So hopefully we'll get some rain where, that, where we get past that. Uh, then when that happens, the, the, the edge is off. But right now your plants are dependent on you and your drip system. So, okay, back all around that. Nine bark, this is an amazing plant. Very unusual. If folks in the Midwest, you know what this is. This is more of a shaded, actually it'll take quite a bit of sun, but in those darker spots in the garden, north sides, east side, even direct west, this plant's got a beautiful like oak leaf to it. And then it's got incredible fall color and very fragrant flower to it. It gets up about this high or so, very easy to care for, but just an unusual plant. You don't see it, you only see it show up this time of year at the garden centers, so nine bark. Nope, only has one name. I wish it had 10 bark or eight bark, it only has nine bark. Yeah. Oh, oh, cultivar. I'll let you look at it later. Pyrocarpus, there you go. Try to spell that or say that 10 times fast. You can come up and look at it. There's two or three varieties down in the lower greenhouse. Let's go over to this one. This is uh, the only really, well, there's two types of party hibiscus that'll grow here. The tropical one that you're used to down in Phoenix or Hawaii, those areas, one with the big flower, it does not grow up here. Oh, it will grow. It's just going to die in the winter. So it'll grow in the summer and then it just collapse in the winter. So it's not winter hardy. This one is winter hardy. This goes down to minus 40 degrees, 30 degrees, some crazy gold that we'll never see. It's called Rose of Sharon. Comes in a single flower, a double flower, comes in whites and pinks and purples and blues, lots of varieties. Uh, the flower is not quite as big, but it makes up for it just sheer quantity. So all these are buds. There must be a hundred buds on this little tiny plant. I've literally had so many buds on a big one that gets up easily head high. It's been this big. It literally had so many flowers and it fell over. I had to stake it up because it had so many flowers on it. It's ridiculous. It's a great plant for here. Pollinator does a lot of good. Blood full sun. Uh, when I get this whole thing planted, what I'll do is I'll take a handful of all-purpose plant food and I'll sprinkle that around the root ball. There is no nutrients in your soil ever. There's no nutrients right now. There's no nutrients when you plant. You'll need what you'll find here is you'll need to fertilize more often than you have other parts of the country. Because of that, what I just said, your, your contractor came in, they took all the topsoil, they scraped it off, and you literally have dead soil. So there's no nutrients, there's no organics, there's no recycling. In fact, if, if a piece of organic matter drops onto a, onto a rock lawn, first thing you do is rake it up. We want no, thank you. No organics. We don't want anything collecting in our yard. And so there's no, there's no, this, there's not this like Midwest recycle, you know, grass is being cut, and there's no composting. Uh, you'll need, your, your plants are more dependent on you for that. And so what that means, you need to fertilize more often. Three times a year, you'll need to fertilize. Um, I, I do it Easter, 4th of July, Halloween. You think holidays, so spring, summer, fall. Uh, your most important feeding by far, October. When you start to see fall color, the aspens are gold, uh, the mums are in full, full bloom, your pansies are starting to come back, your harvesting lettuce, all that fall gardening stuff that you do, uh, that's your cue, put, put your all-purpose plant food, okay? Also, let me just get on my soapbox for just a minute. I'll let you know I am an organic gardener, okay? I like organics, I think it's natural. Obviously it's natural, it's organic. Um, I, did, I think we're too dependent on synthetic foods, Synthetic foods, it's like Scott's Turf Builders, these other, you know, your, your 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10, 10s. These are all chemical based, they're, they're petroleum products. That's where they get the carbon molecule from. And so you're throwing, you're throwing, throwing re reconstituted gasoline out there. It just, it's ridiculous. Um, it does activate very fast. If you're a farmer, probably good. If you're doing 2,000 acres of corn, yeah, you probably need that. We're not, we don't need that. Your backyard can be more strategic with things. And so this is, this, this food I made probably 20 years ago, 15, I don't know, it's been so long I can't remember. Cottonseed meal is the main ingredient. You get it out of Casa Grande. We're famous for our Casa It's got bone meal and uh, all kinds of goodies in it. We've pre-formulated it so you can spread it 
So you don't have to think through. Organic gardening is kind of complicated. How many parts do I need each? Well, here we've got a, we got the recipe. We've hung it in for years. This works. The beauty with organics, two things. One, it releases over a really long period of time. And so you'll find that your numbers is a 744 fertilizer. So 7% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, 4% potash. The reason we can go with lower numbers, we don't need 20, 20, 20, is because it's all being picked up. It's, it's releasing over a slow period of time, so the plant absorbs virtually all of it. Whereas chemicals, they're very fast released. So some of them are releasing after one rainstorm, it's all released, it's gone. Uh, or, or if you're lucky, maybe a month it might stay there. Well, here we get three months of food. That, and if, it, if you put in a chemical out there and it's releasing so fast, the next rainstorm, um, it flushes down. It's not in your plant's root. The plants don't pick it up. It's going downstream, down the dry wash that's now raging. So if I'm going to sell three truckloads, I mean, this is, I don't know, thousands of, of bags of this, thousands of pounds, I think I have a responsibility if we're drinking groundwater to not pollute us or help my clients, customers not pollute us. So anyway, that's, that's I'll get off my soapbox. Use this fertilizer. You'll only find it at Waters Garden Center. You heard me. Okay, so let me cover this. It always comes out gypsum. Should you use gypsum? Should you throw gypsum? Gypsum. If you read the bag, it says it melts rock, makes anything grow. It doesn't do any of that. This is the myth. We get rid of the myth. Google, it will just send you down a rabbit hole that you'll be so confused you won't know what to do. What gypsum does, it helps leach the, the, the minerals out in your soil and flush those out. So that white buildup in your sink, and in your bathtub, your toilets, that, that mineral layer, that also builds up in your soil. And so what this does, it helps to flush that out. Uh, so that's all it does. If, you, if you're planting a rock pile, this is not going to help drainage. It's not going to do that. It might reopen the drainage you already created, but it's not going to create drainage. So I personally don't use gypsum myself. I use it in my vegetable gardens because it's calcium. Calcium is great for blossom end rot on peppers. And so I'm adding some gypsum right now to my vegetable gardens. Because we're getting blossom end rot, you've been watering so much, you'll get this where the blossom was set in your peppers. Your squash won't produce. Uh, I'm a giant pumpkin grower. I like growing pumpkins this big. Uh, well, gypsum is great for that because calcium is what builds up the sidewalls, brings out the flavor on your peaches. Calcium is a lot of benefit, but it doesn't create drainage, it helps to redrain things that are clogged up. So it makes sense, I explained that well enough. So don't get, deep. we don't have chips on the planting trucks, we have jackhammers. Because yep. you can break up the soil, that makes a difference, not chips. If like, if it did, boy, it's way easier than a jackhammer. Yep. Okay, when I'm all done, I have actually pre-mixed this up ahead of time. This is a composted tea, we call it root and grow. So we make ourselves. Um, this I'll have my two gallon water can or five gallon bucket or whatever. When I'm all done, I water in the plant with this. And I'll hit it with this root grow every two weeks until I see the plant stabilized and it's growing. Now, now it's, it's now it's putting new leaves. The flowers are now erupting with new growth. You can tell, oh, it's happy. I'm such a gardener. That's when you can cut this off. And that's when the fertilizer starts taking over. This is for transplant shock purely for transplant shock. It's also the world's greatest houseplant food. You ever want to try houseplants? Oh my gosh. Composted tea, this thing. It's like fish fertilizer, only without the stink. So it kind of looks like fish. Have you ever used fish emulsions, that kind of stuff? It smells like rotting bodies. This doesn't have the rot because it's made from organic. It's made from steep teas. I don't know, from grains, basically. No meat products, so it doesn't smell. Okay, that's how you plant. Questions? Of course. On the 744? Four, yeah. If your plants are already established and you're just doing the three times a year, do you just sprinkle it on the top of the Good question, yeah. So our question for you folks online, this side of the room. So the 744, four, if your plants are already established, make sure I got this, do I have to work this in the ground? 
and I just sprinkle it on, and it will go through the rock and the fabric and through the molds that I have, through the beds. You do not have to work this on. Just chuck and go. I use a hand spreader. I pull the hand spreader up, I just walk around there, and I go, be happy, everyone, just be happy. Go, go, go. Kind of looks salt and peppered when you're all done. I don't water it in, I wait for rain. I am the laziest gardener. I'm almost embarrassed, but I have a beautiful yard. But I don't, the main thing is to get it on there, uh, and I wait for nature to bring it, bring it down. Some folks go, oh, you gotta focus where the drip system is. Put it right where the dripper is. I'm like, don't, don't. All your roots are not right there. Your roots are everywhere. Put the, soil, put the fertilizer where the roots are, not where the water's going to be. Rain will actually activate it. We'll get rain, we get minimal a half inch of rain a month. In the next month, we'll probably get two to three inches of rain. If we look at the historical 100-year average, that's 100 years of data is hard to, hard to go against. But if we don't get rain this month, we, for sure we'll get it next month. The question will be how much. And so for you gardeners that just don't like that answer, you are allowed to take your rake and your shovels and your hose and go work it in if you want. You can go water it if you want. I would rather go Pet the dog, play with grandkids, do something else. Wash the, I would rather wash the car than work fertilizer in the in the yard. That's so. No, just get it on there. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Your dogs like to eat that, so I yeah. have to work it in, in yeah, our okay. garden. Yeah. I mean, I know it won't hurt them, but I don't like them eating. So, so there's there's good. we make two kinds of food. So I've got a this is this is the original. This is cottonseed meal. It's less attractive to dogs and coyotes and that kind of stuff cats uh, they don't find it as, as interesting but it does have an earthy kind of organic smell it does smell organic i mean it's okay to gardeners that's like a great thing to non-gardeners are going to do that stinks i also make a hundred percent organic it's all natural it's not really organic as soon as you put a mineral in there like sulfur and iron you can't call it organic you can call it natural but minerals are technically not organic we have a lot of, especially the, the younger folks, the new families, they want hardcore organic. That's like just pure organic. So we made a, a fruit and vegetable food that's pure organic, okay? There's no mineral, there's no iron. It's just bone meal, blood meals, different kind of meals. We pelletized so you can spread it. That one the dogs will like. Because you know, meat meal, come on, bone meal. That screams of dogs. So I gotta watch Vincent, or we've got a black lab that runs around. So there, I, I use the uh, uh, fruit tree food, the, the vegetable food in the, in the vegetable gardens, and then I'll water it in there to so keep, keep the dogs out of it, or I'll use it in the front yard where I don't have that problem. In the backyard, I spread the all-purpose food, and I find the dogs aren't as interested, especially if you spread it out as much. So, but that's the, that's the difference. That's why you're, thank you for bringing that up. Okay, yes. Yep. So do deer and rabbits eat javelina, eat this particular plant? Um, you'll see this growing in a lot of neighborhoods where deer and rabbits and stuff are, and it's fine. So I think they're going to leave this alone. Now, with that being said, we never say proof. We say resisted because some deer, they don't actually read the list. Yeah. And they said, or what, the way uh, deer, have, they've got a digestive system like a cow. They've got two stomachs, they, get, they chew their cud, and they, they're chewing stuff. They don't actually realize it makes them sick to their second stomach yet. So they nibble on stuff, they're grazing through, they'll nibble some, and then they realize, oh yeah, that's right, I don't like this. Let's move on. They love fruit trees. They love aspens. Those are natural. Now they don't eat this. This is a, this is a spirea. This is one you'll find in the summer. You really only find it the, the June through through fall season, so the, high, the heat season. It does this from now through fall. It's amazing. Animals do, they detest this particular plant. It grows up about that tall, kind of ball shaped, much like a potentilla. These two guys, these are, these are companion plants. These go in the same gardens all the time. Um, animals don't eat either one of these, and they're consistent bloomers. So spirea, there's probably three or four varieties down there. They come in different foliage colors, and then they come in different flower variations, pink, basically. Uh, so great, and it looks like bees are on them. This is another pollinator. It's probably the number one seller of all the summer plants. This is salvia, or autumn sage, this is the common name. Gets up about 
I don't know, three feet or so, kind of kind of vase-shaped or ball-shaped, comes in reds, pinks, whites, purples, apricots. We're trying to introduce more colors all the time. And the reason animals don't like this is when you rub it, well, the reason it's called autumn sage, it has a very sagey scent to it. So you smell the sage kind of kind of herbal scent. Animals don't like herbs. They don't like anything about herbs. I don't know why. Just as something, a defense the plant has thrown into itself to say, animals don't like herbs, smell like a smell like an herb, and they won't eat me. So it's a defensive thing they put on. So this is a great one for hummingbirds. They just think they've died and gone to heaven. Literally, I've seen it. I've seen hummingbirds start across a yard, spot this, and go whoop. Boom, right back into it, just like that. They just love this plant. Um, let's talk about trees, two types. This is a Vanderwolf pine. We have to cover some evergreens because we do have some of the largest evergreen forests in the, in the, on the continent. Uh, some of the largest ponderosa forests anywhere. Evergreens do really, really well here. Junipers, pines are the main, main ones, but Cypress, you've got an Arizona cypress that grows wild just right over the other side of this hill, just other, towards Skull Valley. That's that's where they grow wild. Some of the some of the juniper trees you see, they aren't junipers, they're cypress. And so they just do really, really well here. Um, this particular pine is related to ponderosa pine, it's a Vanderwolf pine or a white pine. The beauty of it is it's just soft. Most evergreens are so pokey, you'd be like little red dots all over your arms just like you look at it. This one, you just you can't go by it without touching it. And then the needles are two-toned. So it's got green on one side, blue on the other, or white. It's got two-toned needles. It's almost like a beautiful gal that's gone to the salon and come back with, wow, nice looking hair, honey. This, that's the pine tree. That's this guy, okay, this gal. Um, when you plant an evergreen, make sure you stake it any size. And here's the reason why. So you're going to add a stake on either side, even a great big, we've got some big six foot, seven foot, 200, 300 pound pine trees over there. Fast growing Austrian pines. They'll keep themselves upright. They don't need to be staked unless we get a heavy wet snow. What will happen is you'll have this thing rooting out and send off new root hairs, real fine white root hairs, and come March, what will happen is we'll get this really heavy wet snow. The plant will actually load up with snow and then it will just fall over, just like that. It doesn't damage the tree. You can prop it right back up and it'd be fine, uh, but you just lost or broke all those root hairs. So now you're just, you're resetting back to square one again. If we can just keep that tree from falling over that first year, just the first growing season, and it won't fall over, um, those root hairs keep going. And then once that second year hits, they bulk up enough, it keeps that tree upright. Nothing can take it over. So this is really important for the bigger, like spruce, the Christmas tree looking ones. You really need to do that for those. Just year one. If it's been two years, you still got these ugly lodge poles on there, take them off. You don't need it anymore. Um, that's, the, that's the one insider tip I can give you on, on pine trees specifically. Any evergreen, juniper, spruce, cypress, fir, cedars, all those are the same. Okay? You get into something like this, this is a maple. This one I don't need to put on the. This is an autumn blaze maple. It gets that red, red leaf to it. It's the number one seller for maples. The reason this is the number one seller is that it's got the classic maple leaf, and this one does not tear or get wind torn or wind damaged. So the wind can be so ferocious it'll actually take the leaf, actually tears it, and so like Acer Rebrum. It'll end up with this torn look, and yeah, it grows, but it's hideous looking. Who wants that kind of maple? This one, the, the way the serration is on the leaf, it seems to let the wind pass through and it doesn't tear up. It's the fastest growing of the red maples. That's another reason. So this thing will grow. This is all new growth right here. That's, that's just, and it's not done. It'll be this much by the time we're done. What happens with these big leafed trees? They're like huge parachutes. Huge sails, they just catch the wind. And so what will happen is in the spring, we'll get this prevailing southwest wind, it just blows nonstop, day and night. It's always blowing, it's mild wind. Maybe in the spring, we'll switch it blow now, but it's not, but in the spring, what'll happen is all the new foliage will come out, 
you know, start to lean to the northeast. And so you'll go through your neighborhood, you'll see trees are just, they're leaning. They're always leaning the same way. The whole neighborhood leaning the same way. That's because they weren't staked that first year. So this tree, I would plant this in my yard. It's a substantial tree. It's got a major trunk. Looks starting to get the canopy to it. It's a little bit young yet, but it'll get fuller. This is a 35 by 25 foot tree, a true shade tree. I would put lodge poles on it on either side. Just see this other root ball. I would tie it just once right there. I would let it bend. I would let it go in the wind, but I wouldn't let it lean over. So the stakes I would keep on there for one year, what I would do the next spring, as I'd clip the ties, whatever, whatever I'm using there, and then I would just keep the stakes in the ground until I had my first windstorm. I'd go, oh, how did it hold up? Did it stay up? If it stood up after the first major windstorm, I'd take that, break those lodge poles off and get rid of them. If it needs to go back on, well, the lodge poles get them in the ground, that's the hard part. It's easy to tie it back up, so I leave those on. I don't commit to breaking those off until I know it's really going to take, it's going to take the wind. But usually we keep our, I mean, you'll see your neighborhoods where the trees are majorly mature. We planted 10 years ago, they're still on lodge poles. Those should have been pulled off years ago so we're keeping our, our line we're keeping our stakes on too long but for the first year especially fruit trees uh, like apples the peaches are coming off right now plums are loaded uh, the, this is a good fruit year uh, you get a big canopy of this this uh, apricot tree or, or pear tree it'll load up and put 500 pounds of pears on and, and it's leaning like this literally i've seen them fall out of the ground literally they just fall right over because they weren't growing straight. So if they've got a great scaffolding or structure to it, and they're growing straight, that tree could hold a tremendous amount of weight. But if it's leaning, all of a sudden that those roots, if there's any weakness in the roots, it falls right over. Um, okay, questions on that? Then we'll cover watering. What's up? Oh, I don't know, 12 feet or so. I don't know, guys, some of you contractors know better, 10, 11 feet, something like that. So it's, it's tall. I've got big ones though. Yeah, instantaneous. Yeah. Would you stake the aspen? I probably would stake the aspens. They're not as prone to it, um, and they protect themselves, especially a cluster, a single trunk. I would. Multis, it depends. If it's in a corner where it's protected by some fences or something, maybe not. It's out exposed by itself. Yes. If you're up on a ridge line where you got the vistas and the wind, for sure I would stake it. If in doubt. Stake it out, yeah. This is how you water. This is made to tape inside your garden journal, inside your irrigation box. It's made to be a reminder, tape it with my face away from you. So you don't have to look at it. But the back side is how you water here. And you'll see established plants, things that have been in for at least a season or two. Those things you're watering one time a week. Deep soak, that should be enough, especially trees, shrubs, and vines. Things with a deep root structure. Uh, I think we tend to over frequency. The frequency is too much on new gardens, especially. So everyday watering is not needed for trees and shrubs. They won't like that. Uh, for new plants, all this stuff we just planted, we just talked about. There, we're going to water things twice a week. The reason being, the roots are still still confined, but you still have like this beautiful grass. We are in such great grass country. This is a coral forester grass. This, this was, has been perennial of the year. It's so glorious. It starts to bloom in April. It doesn't stop until the end of the year. It is an amazing grass. Uh, this is as tall as it gets. In the winter, when I'm all done with it and the snow's clapped and it's fallen over, I take my lawnmower and go, Wah! that's how I prune it. It's just so easy. Um, this plant, the roots are right here though. Once the roots grow out, it's kind of got a, a root like a grass or a palm tree, very fibrous, lots of roots. It's going to have a root mass like this, super hardy plant, super tough. Uh, but at first, it depended on you for, for water. Put those emitters, one or two emitters, on the, right over the edge of the root ball, and then water it twice a week because it's more dependent on you. Next year, the roots have now doubled in size. The year after that, it's quadrupled six times the size. Now it's really less dependent on, on your drip system. Now you can back it up to once a week. It's just fine. I, I don't think I water mine once a week. It's probably once every 10 days or so. How often I water mine? Okay. The lawns are different. They're on there. 
there you're probably watered every day, every other day for lawns right now. It's hot. And then your, your tomatoes, vegetables, that kind of the shallow rooted stuff, you're probably watering like, like a vegetable garden every day, every other day. So, but trees and shrubs, one to two times a week, deep soak, you're probably leaving that drip system on for an hour minimum, to more like two hours, an hour and a half, two hours. It depends on how many emitters you have. Okay, with that, I think I've covered everything I wanted. Um, fertilize, not fertilize this fall, I have seen a lot of plants out in the yard that are obviously lacking nutrients. Um, I'm starting to see some plants turn color. That means they are truly stressed out. That is one plant that is screaming for help. It's being overwatered, it's in soils, it just doesn't take. It's just it's not happy where it's at. Most likely it's when we've been watering trying to compensate for the heat and we flushed all the food out of the soil and so that plant is literally it's emaciated. It's just, it's just it's starving to death. Fertilize it with the all-purpose food and it will green right up, just like that. If you want fall color, fertilize now. You're fertilizing now. Your maples and aspens and things for fall color, you're fertilizing now for fall color. What will happen is if it doesn't have the right nutrients or your peach reaches too high, it'll be muted. Or what should be a red maple will be a light orange yellow maple. It won't have the same richness, the same color. If you're fertilizing now to bring that color out. And the reason being, there's no food in your soil. You need to replenish that uh, to the plants, especially June, July. It just has been, we've been watering a lot. So we flushed the nutrients out of our soil so we replenish those. It's, it's been a hard summer, it really has. It's been hard to own a garden center this year. It's hot outside. And you're slapping trees back and forth, oh my gosh. Okay, any last question? I'll take one from this side, one from this side. If not, I'll hang out, and if I happen to miss your questions, or you're just not comfortable, I'll, uh, I'll just hang. Yes? We inherited some grapes that were in containers. Gotcha. And they, the first year, they did pretty well. They're too small. Yeah. When, did, when can I repot those in that bigger? Great question. So, he's got grapes that he inherited, so... They were in pots. They did great last year. They're struggling this year because we think we've outgrown the space. It doesn't, as soon as you said, I have grapes in pots, I'm struggling. I mean, yeah, we need to upsize. Grapes have very aggressive root structures. So just double the size of the pot. You can do it anytime you want. Right now, if they've got fruit on them, I'd probably wait till after I've harvested the fruit. Oh, yeah, they're too stressed. They get fruit on you. So I just do it now. Just go for it. Get that, for you, it's going to be get potting soil. Use the water's potting soil, fill that up around the grapes, and then water it with the root grow because it will be stressed or get kind of weepy and be talkative. Uh, it'll it'll cry, it'll cry out. I don't like this, Dad. Help me. This will help it get less stressed. Can you something over here, Dad. So all purpose. Can you use it on grass? Uh, yes, greatest grass food ever. Mainly because it's got bird guano in it too. It's a bird, bird poop. Poop and grass go together. The bird poop and grass really goes together. That's a, a nitrogen source. That's also where the smell comes from, sorry. But it does make grass green like, like in, by this time next week, wow. Get the lawnmower, you better sharpen the blades. It's gonna go crazy. <laughs> Thank you all, thanks for being here. Thanks for supporting Waters, even during this hard time. We appreciate that, you folks online. We appreciate you as well. Although we do expect you to come in here, we'd love to see you here at Waters. Thanks you all, I'll let you clap.